down actually on Hades. But let's go back to Deuteronomy 32, 22. This is a great scripture that I read. I had to give a, an apologetic when I was in Russia on the subject of Hades and hell. I don't, I, somebody said they got confused. And I don't know why anybody would be confused because there's, there's the Hadean world that now, that now is and there's the lake of fire which is to be revealed. Right now, the hell, there's two hells if you want to look at it like that. The hell that is now, Jesus pictures it as being in the heart of the earth. Uh, we know that's the place where Jesus went. We're going to see in Luke 16, it had two compartments where the spirits of the righteous went on one side, Abraham's bosom, and on the other, where the rich man went, and that was a place of torment. He was tormented in the flame. But in Revelation, we read last week that death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. All right, so that's, that's the eternal hell. Hell is an English word, comes from the German, the Germanic, the, you know, the English are Angles, and they were at once Germanic. You can wrap all of the European peoples together pretty much under the ten Germanic kingdoms. So the word, the word hell is the English version of Hades. In the Greek, it's the place, the underworld, the place where you went when you died. But in Deuteronomy 32, there's a great verse here. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe, if uh, I had to check, I think this is the first mentioned principle. Well, it's not the first mentioned principle. I'm sorry. The, uh, Jacob said, I'll go down to the grave I'll go down to Hades lamenting the death, the death of my son Joseph when he didn't die, but he thought he died when the brothers brought him in the coat of many colors. And he said, I'll go down into the Hadean world. I'll go down to death. Nobody's going to comfort me. You know, what a, what a pretty sad life. What a sad existence. As Christians, we should, be able to, we should be able to go through a tragedy and have the faith and the comfort of, of heaven to be able to get us through the loss of a loved one. Now, in Deuteronomy 32, 22, what does it say? The Song of Moses. God the Father is angry. He already knows what is going to be the end of the Jewish people. This is where we started last week. And, uh, and interestingly, 32, starting in verse 20, he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. Isn't that something that God knows what our end will be? The Lord knows. He knows our beginning. He knows our end. That would be a scary thought to see what the end would be. I pray that our end will be a glorious one and not a tragedy. Who wants to have a tragedy? We want to have the end of glory. They are a perverse generation. We're talking about the end of Israel, the end of the, of the children of Israel. They've provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They've moved me to anger by their foolish idols. I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. And that perhaps is talking about the Gentiles. God is, God has, is going to raise up a new people. He's going to raise up a new people. He's, the Jew is going to be rejected. Paul, in Acts 13, says it was necessary to preach the gospel to you first, the Jew. He says, since you count yourself unworthy... He said, uh, unworthy of eternal life. Let, let's look at that. That's a very powerful scripture there in Acts 13. Paul, this is where Paul is one of those famous lines. In Acts 13, verse 45, it says, when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy, contradicting and blasphemy. You know, I... I get a lot of that from the denominational world. You know, if I would just take out baptism and the Lord's Supper, I could blend in with all of the Christian denominations today. Did you know that? I could pretty much get along with any, any denomination, take out baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, but what do we get when you contend for truth? There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. You can't get away from that, can you? How can you? And there's only one body, only one way to get into the body of Christ. You've got to be born into it. You can't join. So what do we get? We get envy. We get contradictions. We get blasphemy. Acts 13, 45. And 
They oppose. We get opposition, don't we? Opposition. They oppose the things spoken by Paul. Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. And here's what they said. Quote, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. And then they give a quote from Isaiah. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for the salvation to the ends of the earth. All right. So, God's angry. He's jealous. Jealous of his wife, the bride of Christ. And then he says this in verse 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger, shall burn to the lowest. The lowest what? I'm in Deuteronomy 32. Verse 22, a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. Sheol, Sheol in the Hebrew, Hades in the Greek, it's the same place. It shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Isn't that amazing? It's going to set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now in Acts chapter 2, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. How important is Hades you know, in, the, in Christianity, in the New Testament? Well, Peter spends some time on that Hadian world. In Acts 2, 25, he says, and the reason, he, and the reason that Peter has to spend a lot of time on Hades on the day of Pentecost is because he's going to beef up the resurrection. The Christian faith is based on the resurrection, right? So we need to have a lot of information when Jesus died where he went. This is great teaching for the Muslims. They think Jesus passed out on the cross, and uh, they laid him unconscious in the tomb, and he revived. Now, where would they get that at? I was talking to one of my friends. I said, do you think the centurion knew... A dead body, you think that Roman soldier, the centurion, a veteran of all those wars, you think he knew a dead person when he saw one? Oh, I thought you were talking about my electronics. Yeah, he was pierced in the side. Truly, this man was a son of God. Pilate asked if he were dead, and the centurion signed the death certificate. He was dead. You think, you think they were deceived? Now, what happened when Jesus died? I'm in Acts 2.25. Well, the prophecies, you know, and, and David is writing a thousand years before Christ. The prophecy said this, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. Now, the, now in the Old Testament it was Sheol. So Peter's quoting David. This is good here. You know why? Because somebody might say, well, how do you know that Sheol is Hades? Well, Peter's quoting David. Peter, in, in the Greek language recorded by Luke, the book of Acts, is making a quotation from the Old Testament. It was from the Septuagint. They translated the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek. That was a good thing because we know if there's a word in the New Testament, you can use that Septuagint and find out what the Old Testament equivalent would be in the Hebrew. For instance, the word repent. Anybody know what the word would be in the Old Testament if you read the Proverbs or Deuteronomy or if you read the, the, the Prophets? Do you know what they would say? Do you know what they would tell the Israelite people? They didn't use the word repent. They used the word turn. Turn. So whenever you see the word turn in the Old Testament, you know it's, it's like John the Baptist saying repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's in uh, Matthew 3. In Matthew 4, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of, God is at, kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't that funny? John the Baptist... They, they, they summarized his sermon in one sentence, and Jesus' preaching was summarized in one sentence, and it was the exact word for word same. 
You can check it out. I, I forget exactly the verse. It's like Matthew 3, 15, Matthew 4, 17. What, you can find that in there. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, I'm so amazed today. People want to take one part of the plan of salvation and put an only on it. Now, why would somebody do that? Faith only. Well, what about all the other things that the scriptures tell us we should do? How about obey? How about uh, hear the word of God? Oh, yeah, we got to hear. Yeah, everybody knows we got to hear. Well, so you believe we got to hear? You believe we got to obey? Yes, we got to obey. Do we have to repent? Yes, we have to repent. Well, then why do you put only? Well, it's because they've created a philosophy, see? When you create a philosophy, you can't just let the scripture speak for itself. You've got to help it. You say, you've got to help it so it'll match what your creed was written 500 years ago. And all the Protestants saw that verse justified by faith. That's from Romans 3 and 4. Paul is talking to Jews who didn't believe. Isn't that funny? The one thing that the Jew didn't have a problem with hearing the word of God and repenting and uh, uh, baptism. The Jews had more washing than anybody else. The one thing that the Jews refused to do is the one thing that Paul's driving a hard bargain on in Romans 3 and 4. And that's believe that Jesus is the Christ. Amen? But Paul wasn't writing in the Protestant Reformation. And so they got in this fight, justification by faith, Protestants and the Catholics, and so the Protestants said faith only. So that's where we got faith only. That's where we got this whole discussion on faith only. That's, we're still having it. Why would you want to put it only? If you judge by Jesus and John the Baptist sermons, it's repent only. Now that wouldn't make sense, would it? Repent only, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, Peter said repent, didn't he? Repent and be baptized. Acts 2, the birthday of the church. You will not leave my soul in Hades. I'm in Acts 2, 27. Are you with me? Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You know, we look at death. There's two words for death, by the way. There's, there's, there's a word that's used of death from the perspective of the living. We just see a corpse. We see a dead body. And that's the word necros. And that's the, the physical view of death from the vantage point of time. But the Greeks were well aware... They weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. They knew that death was more than annihilation. They knew that you, your spirit went somewhere. In fact, they had this idea, Hades. Hades was the place of the underworld, and they had a god named Hades who ran it. Now, isn't that interesting? And do you know in English, I've said this, in our English, the Scandinavians, the Anglo-Saxons, they called it hell, and there was a god named hell who ran it with a little g, God. Are you with me? Jesus didn't rebuke him. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, he told Peter, and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. Jesus just let it go. He didn't sit there and say, you dummies, there is an underworld, and it is ruled over by a god. His name's not Hades. It's not hell. It's not Pluto, the Greek god of the underworld. Who's the god of the underworld? It's the devil. Because the whole world was brought under the dominion of sin. Now, there was another guy by the, whose name means destroyer. And he's mentioned in the Old Testament and in Revelation too. And his name is Abaddon or Apollyon. Did you know that? Destroyer. Satan is called the destroyer. Let's, let's look at that. Let's, since we mentioned it, Revelation. Because that's one of the names of the devil in regard to his ministry, if you want to call it that, uh, of taking everybody down, the whole human race. Well, Apollyon, I bet. I'm in Revelation 20. Here it says that in verse 13, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into into the lake of fire. So that's the difference. Hades is going to be cast in the lake of fire. So you got the, the temporary hell, Hades, you got the permanent. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, what, I, I glossed over that. Thank you. Yeah, everyone was judged according to his, verse 13, what do you got? Revelation 20, 13. Every man's judged according to his deeds or works. Same, same word in the Greek, ergo, ergos. It means your work. So our works are important. Our works define us. Uh, we're judged by our works. Uh, wisdom is justified by her children. We're judged by our results, aren't we? Boy, if, if we could go into politics, we could just be judged by our intentions. Wouldn't that be great and not be judged by our results? We could just do all these social programs and put them into effect, you know, and be judged on our good intentions, sincere, and not worry about what it does, you know, the havoc that we wreak, W-R-E-A-K. All right, in Revelation 9, I want you to see this. Revelation 9, uh, there was a king over the underworld. And uh, Mr. Dowdy's talked about this in our Revelation class. Uh, he had a key, and he was given the key to the bottomless pit in Revelation 9.1. Now, who's this king here? Well, he opened a bottomless pit, smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, so on and so forth. Then out of the smoke, the locusts came on the earth, scorpions, all right, and uh, they're going to terrorize the witnesses of God. Let's just... Let's just put it that way. So I would take the king to be a wicked king and his, his servants likened to scorpions and locusts. Are locusts good or bad? Now we have some locusts here in Virginia and they come out every 17 years. But they don't call them locusts. What do they call them? Can't hear you. Cicadas. You know, it could be, and, and my wife saw one of these articles uh, in, in one of these local papers. People actually will eat these cicadas, put them on a sandwich. What does that sound like? Now, a cicada in the Bible, they didn't have all the species and subspecies we have today. They didn't have all that zoologist, to taxonomist. But there was a guy in the Bible who ate locusts, right? His name was John the Baptist. Might have been cicadas. Who knows? He cooked them? They're eating them raw. You tell me who's civilized and who's a barbarian. Well, locusts are bad things. They devour your crops. Scorpions, what are they known for? Pleasant animals, right? You want to keep them as pets. They're the ministers of the devil. And they had this king over them, and he had key. He had one key. And what is his name here in verse 11, in Revelation 9, 11? They had a king over them. And, uh, of course, these scorpions, in verse 10, had tail, stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt. You know, we have power, don't we? We want to have power. Do we want to use power to hurt people or to help them? We want to help people, don't we? We want to save people. We want to love people, right? Uh, well, anyway, 11, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. Now, if you look up the cross-references, we don't have time. He's mentioned in different places, but he's called the destroyer. You know, there's, I meet young people, and I don't know why, met, met some young men, they just had this propensity for violence, wanted to hurt, wanted to destroy. You know, that's the nature of the devil. Want to destroy and tear things down. It's easy to tear something down. It's hard to build it up, isn't it? And this is who this king was, a bad end, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So we have the Hebrew name, the Greek name. He's the, he's the keeper of the pit. Are you with me? The keeper of this Hadean world. We got Sheol, Hades. We got Abaddon, Apollyon. Now there's a great verse that I didn't prepare in my notes this morning. Somebody look up strong man. Somebody look up the strong man. Bind the strong man, because that's what Jesus did. And in Revelation, let's turn over here to Revelation 1. And I want you to see Jesus had keys. Now, he gave keys to Peter to unlock the door of the kingdom, of the church. But in Revelation 1, he's got some keys to unlock a couple other things. All right? Who's got Revelation 1? 
verse 18. Revelation 1, 18. Who's got that? He's got the keys to death and Hades, right? I mean, that's a pretty good savior, don't you think? Want to help people. Even the Scientologists can't get us across that. Through those prison doors, can they? The Scientologists? L. Ron Hubbard? Want to help people? You know, we have a shepherd, right? We have pastors. You know who the Scientologists have? They, they have pastors too, but they don't call them pastors. They're called auditors. Auditors. They audit you. And then they, they have like their churches, but if you're a celebrity, you get a special celebrity church. A celebrity. You, you don't just join the average Joe, Tom, and Dick and Harry congregation. You get in the celebrities congregation. And then they audit you. How about Jesus? Isn't Jesus a good savior, a good shepherd? And you remember that little poem about him carrying through the sand? Remember the paths? Two sets of footprints in the sand? Remember that? It's on everybody's bathroom door, isn't it? I saw the sands of time and saw two sets of footprints, one the Lord and one myself. And I saw there were times of crisis in my life when there was only one set. Lord, how could you forsake me when... I was at the worst times of my life. Oh, my child, it was then when I carried you. Oh, one set of footprints during the times of trial. Then there were other times when things were going good and there was a big swath through the sand. Lord, I saw the two sets of footprints when we walked hand in hand and I saw the one set of footprints when you had to carry me during my times of trial. What's that big swath? Oh, my child, that's when I had to drag you kicking and screaming. All right, where are we at? Roman, or, uh, Revelation 118. Jesus has the keys to death and Hades, so he's going to unlock it. Now, did anybody find that strong man passage that I needed? Yeah. Mark 327. Figure it's Mark. Why? Mark's written to Romans, right? Whenever you talk about strong men being bound, uh, the Romans are going to get perked at attention, aren't they? All right, where are you at? Romans 3, uh, 24. A kingdom, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand, right? And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen against himself, risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. So what's this talking about? The strong man is the devil. And Jesus is going to bind the strong man. The strong man has actually broken into the house and taken captive, locked up all the goods, the plunder, and possessions. And the possessions would be the human race. Jesus is going to ransom. The word redeem also has a definition that means ransom. He's going to ransom us, the sons of men. He's going to bind the strong man, and he's going to rescue or ransom the hostages and the goods. And that's here in Mark 3, 27. All right, there's one other verse that I want. Let's go to Zechariah 9. I want to take you down into the underworld in Zechariah, written about 600 years before Christ. Zechariah 9, there, were, there was a place where there were prisoners. And they were called prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope. Now, who has Zechariah 9, 
verses 11 and 12. Amen. Let's look at this. Rejoice greatly, O Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's just having salvation. Lowly, riding on a donkey. Now, what's that a picture of? When did the king come riding on a donkey? I'm told that the king had two vehicles in his driveway. He had his military vehicle, and he had his domestic peacetime vehicle. Now... He had his wartime vehicle, his APC, his armored personnel carrier, and he doesn't want to run up the mileage on it. It's probably a more expensive vehicle, right? So he rides around in his domestic uh, car, his uh, Ford Taurus. They didn't have cars in the first century, did they? They had a donkey and they had a charger, not a Dodge Charger. 69 Dodge Charger. What's a charger? It's an animal that charges. It's a white horse, a stallion. And when the king would ride on the horse, you knew he was going to war. When he rode, if he came up to your home riding on his donkey, he was coming in peace. What would you rather have the king riding up in your driveway on? Well, if he's going to war, he's probably going to take your husband, your sons, it's going to be hard on you. He's going to probably have to tax half of your garden to feed the troops. Taxes are going to go up. It's expensive going to war. See? But if he's coming in peace, how did Jesus enter Jerusalem? On a donkey. How's he coming back? In his second coming. Came the first time on a donkey. He's coming the second time in a horse, right? Well... Here's what he's going to do. There's an obscure verse. We're all familiar with verse 9. But how about verse 10? I will cut the chariot off. Okay, that's a sp specific short-term prophecy here, applying in the near immediate Jewish vicinity. The battle bow shall be cut off. He'll speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. That's interesting. What's that talking about? All those righteous people who went down onto the Lazarus side, the Abraham's bosom side of that Hadian world, they were righteous. Their spirits went, right? The body went to the tomb. Their spirits went down. Why couldn't they go to heaven? Why couldn't they just go to heaven when they die? We already read last week, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. For a Christian to die, where do we go? Now. Now. So you've got to see the word now in the Bible. Many, many times the word now appears. There's a, there's a very important reason why. Could anybody go to heaven before the blood of Christ was shed? Could anybody get... The aphesis, that's a Greek word. It means total release. Total release, total acquittal of their sins before Christ died. Look very quickly here in Romans 3. We're, we're doing good on our time economy here. I'm going to add a word, verse here. Romans 3.25, whom God, uh, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a, what do you got? Propitiation? Propitiation. What does propitiate mean? We've studied that word. We know, don't we? It's a covering. If your wife's mad at you, husbands, what do you do? You go out. It's the easiest thing in the world to solve. You go out, buy a dozen, a bouquet, a dozen roses, come back, knock on the front door, hide it behind your back, and she comes to the door, and you say, if she's, Mad at you? I don't even want to see your... F what do you got there in your hand there behind your back? Oh, bouquet of a dozen red, beautiful red roses. And you propitiate her anger. 
All right? Free little free advice. You propitiate. That's what the blood of Jesus did to God's anger, his wrath. God's wrath poured out on sin. All right? Don't go out of here remembering my romantic uh, recipe. I want you to remember, what I want you to go out of here and remember is what Jesus' blood did to the wrath of, and the anger of God that was against sin. It appeased it. The death penalty was paid. Why can't people understand that? That's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Isn't that the beauty, the heart of the gospel? Is that the blood of Jesus? Vanquished the devil. Not only did it vanquish the devil, but it, it covered uh, God, whom God set forth, that is the grace, the redemption of Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, that is a covering by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had what to the sins previously committed? What did he do? Passed over. Do you all, does anybody have remission? The old, it's a bad translation, the old King James. The word there is paresis. Very important. God didn't forgive, totally acquit, release the sins under the first covenant. Paresis, he went around it. Para. Paradise. Paradise, in the Old Testament, paradise didn't necessarily mean heaven. It just meant on the other side of the hedge. The other side of death. That's what it meant. Jesus said to the thief, today you're with me in paradise. If you know what paradise means, it just means on the other side. Now, in the Old Testament, the other side meant what? Down. But now, after Christ's blood is shed, what is the other side? It's up. How do you like that, Tim? The word paradise, just that word technically means, now today it's a reference to heaven, of course. Why? Because we're on this side of the cross. But paradise to the Old Testament people was down. Now they still had hope. But not until the blood of Christ is shed are those guys, are their spirits going to go to heaven. So Zechariah 9, the good news is, the bad news is, he says, return. Look at verse 11 and 12. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set the prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold. You've got to go back and wait, you prisoners of hope. At least they have hope, right? Now, even the people on the wicked side had hope, didn't they? We're going we're gonna to hold that question in thought here. It says, return to the stronghold, prisoners of hope. Even today, I declare, I will restore double to you. So he's going to give them, he's going to give them a double gift, double fold, but they got to go back and wait. They got to go back and wait in the stronghold, in the, in the prison. These are the righteous spirits because it's in the waterless pit. You know, demons don't like water. Have you ever noticed that? When demons were coming down, and however in the world they did this, I have no idea. I mean, I, I got some theories, but really, ultimately, we don't know. The sons of God, which are clearly angels, B'nai Elohim, never used of patriarchs. How they came down and intermarried with the human race, I'll never know. All right? But after the flood, did that ever happen again? Are you with me? All right, what about when the demons went into the swine? And those pigs are a lot smarter than people, Preacher D commented. They didn't like being demon-possessed. People don't mind being demon-possessed. Oh, come on in. I'll take you right in. Come on into my home. I'm not talking about your house. I'm talking about your home. Hey, there's a great sign in this gym. They got all the gymnastic equipment up. I don't know what we're going to do tonight. I, don't, I doubt we're going to play basketball tonight because <laughs> I invited a bunch of people, so... I don't know how I'm going to get out of that one. But anyway, the gym teacher here is a friend of ours. And he has a sign, and it says something like, you know, staying in shape is so important. Keeping, keeping your bodies physically fit is important because where else are you going to live? I thought that was pretty good, don't you? I mean, that's about as strong as you can get without coming out and saying your body is a temple of God, isn't it? Your body is a temple of God can't say that, but you live in your home. Your body is your home. You live in. And isn't that funny? Because the Holy Spirit wants to be a guest. Ben Alexander said a long time ago, I never forgot, that the word guest in German goes back to ghost. Because your spirit is a guest in your home. 
guest and ghost are related. And you're either going to have the Holy Spirit, you're going to have an evil spirit, and everybody is vying to live in your home. Now, the pigs were really smart because they didn't want those demons in them. So what are, where did they go to get the demons out? They all got in a herd, and they plunged off the cliff into the Sea of Galilee, and they were baptized. And when the pigs were baptized, they, they didn't get the death, burial, and resurrection. They got the going down. They never came up. But they didn't care. They would rather go down and get the demons out than to live in demon possession. So what's the moral of the story? Take a lesson from the swine. The pigs know. The pigs know. Now in Luke 16, yes, there is still a little hope on that bad side. How can that be? You can't get out of Hades, can you? No, you can't. Not even Hercules. Did Hercules ever get out? They might have let him out. Did Hercules get out? Did he ever escape Hades through his works? I forget. We'll have to watch the movie. Hercules is kind of a picture of Jesus because somehow they knew that Jesus was going to get out of Hades. No, you could go in, but you could never come out. And Jesus was able to come out, wasn't he? Because he had the keys to get out. But in Luke 16, it says that, uh, well, in Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and linen, fared sumptuously every day. He had the life of Raleigh, living ease and pleasure. But a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, didn't have neosporin. So it was, the beggar died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, look at this. And being in torments in Hades. Now if you've got the old King James, it'll say being in torments in hell. Are you with me? you got Hades, which now is. you got the lake of fire yet to come. Being in torments in hell, lifted up his eyes. He saw Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So on the wicked side, you got torment, and you got fire and flame. Right? Why would you ever want to sing a song, I'm on the highway to hell? I mean, people that do that, they must not love themselves. They must not count themselves worthy. All my friends are going to be there too. I wonder how the Lord thinks about that. It's like Paul to the Jew. You don't think yourself worthy. It's hard to try to save somebody that doesn't have a high estimation of their worth as a soul in Christ, right? All right, let's finish. Abraham said, son. How would you like to have a conversation with Abraham? Son, remember, in your good lifetime, you receive good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted, and you are tormented. Besides all this, there's a great, I have a gulf. It's not an oil company. I wonder where they got that word. You know, it's starting to come to me now. When they drill for oil, where do they drill? Where do they drill? Where's oil? Is it up? Sideways or is it down? How far down? Hundreds of feet? Thousands? I wonder where they got their name. The word golf, you got chasm? How many have chasm? C-H-A-S-M. You, it's, you spell it like a K sound. It's not a chasm. It's a chasm. It's an abyss. It's the bottomless pit. That's where... Michael threw the devil and his angels 
When? In the days of Moses? No, after Christ died. There's a bottomless pit, Abraham said. It's a gulf, it's a chasm, it's an abyss. So that it's fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor vice versa. We can't cross this chasm. Verse 27, there is hope in hell. Not for yourself, but for who? Others. Then, he said, get it, then? It wasn't open for debate, was it? Couldn't contradict. Then, he said, the rich man said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. There's hope for others that they won't come. I mean, why are we here this morning? Why are we here on this earth? To be saved? Save others and warn people. I told you about the now. Let's end in John 12. I didn't get all my scriptures, but I got a good one of them. Let's finish up next week or next time. Let's talk about Gehenna, the garbage pit. Gehenna, we'll use the word Tartarus. Go to Peter. We'll go and we'll get the captives. I didn't actually get all the scriptures to get the captives out uh, from 1 Peter 3 and Ephesians 4. And then we'll finish. But this is great here because when did all this happen, you see? In John chapter 12, in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. John 12, 29. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thunders. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now listen to this. This is one of the most important verses with a now in it. Now. Baptism does now save you. It didn't used to save you. 1 Peter 3.21. People didn't used to get baptized before John the Baptist. But now, after Christ died, now it saves you. Because it's your appeal of a good conscience by virtue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See? Now, I'm in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. A lot of things happened in heaven and earth. When Jesus died, when he rose again, when the church began, a lot of things happened in heaven and earth. We see these things that happen on earth in the Bible, but there were many things that happened below the earth and above the earth. And that's why we have to go to Luke 16, Revelation, to get a picture of all the things that happened. It was a big day. The cross. Satan was cast out. The demonic world was chained. How much room do they have? How much chain did they have? as much as we give them. Isn't that right? Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for the victory over the devil. Thank you for these scriptures, Lord. And I'm so glad now that Jesus, when he died, went down and cleaned that world out and took all those people to heaven. We don't have to go there anymore into the Hadean world. Now when we die, a Christian dies, we can go straight to be with Jesus in heaven. Lord, uh, we pray that, that we'll be a blessing to you and pray that we have something to give this morning, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, Lord, as a living sacrifice. Pray that you will be with us and help us to see your glory and help us to live a life that is of worthy service to you. In Jesus' name, amen.